Hey folks, I know I am just an old guy telling stories, but please leave a like and subscribe before we start. Let's enjoy in today's stories. I put me and my family in danger because of the dark web. Before we start, I want to say all the real names will be replaced with fake ones. Hello Reddit, my name is John. Right now, in my last year of college. But this story happened years ago. This happened when mystery boxes openings were a trend on YouTube. Back then I was watching all these videos on YouTube about how people were opening mystery boxes from the dark web. This was really interesting to my high school mind back then. I watched video after video like there is no tomorrow. You can say I was obsessed with dark web mystery boxes. What I didn't understand and know at the time is that all those videos were fake and staged. One day I decided to learn about how to access the dark web. I watched a few tutorials and there was I downloading Tor and a VPN. Tor is a browser to access the dark web. And a VPN is just a safety measurement. So after I did all of that I was on the dark web. I quickly found a website selling mystery boxes. Most of them offered different sized mystery boxes for different prices. And they wanted Bitcoin for payment. I didn't know how to get Bitcoin, so they were not an option for me. Then after searching and scrolling for a while, I found a website where you can pay with a credit card. I still didn't have my own back then. So I waited one day when my parents weren't home and I used theirs. You probably already know I did something very stupid the moment I paid with credit card, right? I mean, sharing your personal information on the dark web is the worst thing you can do. I even wrote down my street and house number but I didn't know back then. And looking back now, if I paid with Bitcoin and ordered it on another address back then, maybe, just maybe, I wouldn't put myself and anyone else in danger. So after paying, I put the credit card back from where I took it. After a few days, the package was here. The only bad thing is that I didn't find it first. It was my mom. I still remember I was in my room and I heard my mother screaming from the kitchen. I run straight down to my mother. I asked if she was okay. She didn't say anything, not a single word. She was just terrified. When I took a look inside the box, that is when I realized what I had done. I don't know how much I can say about what was inside the box because I don't want this post to get taken down. I will just say it was something very disturbing. There was also, besides that disturbing stuff I don't want to talk and think about a CD. And also, there was another smaller box with pictures. They were pictures of me and my family. After seeing all that, my mother asked what is going on. What the hell is this? She said that she will call the police. I was extremely scared now to not get in trouble. So I stopped her. I told her about what I have done. I told her that I ordered a mystery box from the dark web. She didn't know what the dark web is, so I had to explain that as well. After telling her everything to this day, I still remember that slap. She slapped me so hard, yelling at me, what the hell is wrong with you? Are you stupid? I think I even started crying, saying I am sorry. Then she gave me a hug. Then after a while, we calmed down and she said, let's see what is on that CD. On that CD was how the dude who sent us, more specifically me, the disturbing stuff inside the box, how he got that stuff. The video was so disturbing, my mother just shut it off. She said, we are waiting for your father to get home, then we are going to the police. After a few hours, my father got home. My mom explained everything to him. Then he got mad and started yelling at me. I deserved it. We all went to the police. There, I didn't say a single word. My parents explained to them what I had done. I was lucky at the time because I was still 17. If I was 18, they could legally hold me there for questioning and stuff, I think. I'm not sure. We left the box at the police station and then we went home. When we got home, I went straight to my room. The next morning, I got up and got ready for school. I didn't say a word to my parents. Neither did they. I left for school and shortly after me, my parents left as well. They had work. They always left in the morning and came back at night around nine. So I was always first to come home. So while I was at school, I wasn't exactly happy that day to be there. I was spacing out. The classes passed fast before I even noticed. When I went home, the first thing I noticed 
is that the front door was open. The first thing I did was enter inside and I yelled, Mom, Dad, is that you? But there was no one inside. Inside the living room, it was a mess. I quickly called my parents. They told me to go to our neighbor's house. Then polices arrived at my house. Not long after, so did my parents. My mom came to my scared, asked me if I'm okay. I said I'm fine, I was at school. Then she thanked our neighbor for keeping an eye on me while she arrived. Then she took my hand and we went to where my father is and where the police is. He said that the police said it was a burglary, but we all knew this was happening because of what I did. For a few days, the police said that we need to find another place to stay at. We couldn't take any of our stuff because that was a crime scene now. They knew our situation with the dark web, so they sent us two police officers just for our safety. We rented a hotel room and stayed there for two or three days. The days passed so slow there. I wasn't allowed to go anywhere. I watched TV all day long. Then I remember we went back to our house again. We took our stuff and we were ready to leave. I asked my parents where we are going. My father angrily answered, You shut the firm up. This is happening because of you and your stupidity. So just shut up. Sit there and don't say anything. I don't want to hear your voice. So I just sat at the back seat quietly, and after a few hours' drive, I knew where we were going. We were going over to my grandparents' house. We stayed there for a few weeks. I know I was grounded and I couldn't go outside. My phone, my computer, and everything I had of technology was taken from me. I lived like that for nearly a month. That is when we moved again. This time, the move was bigger. When I say bigger, I mean another country. My parents found another job there. I went to a different school. I was forced to learn a new language. At home, we. When I say we, I mean me and my parents. We made a promise or a deal or call it whatever you want not to talk about happened to anyone. If someone asked us why we moved, I was supposed to answer because of my parents' work. But not everything was dark as you think. I liked it here. I made new friends. After a while, I got closer to my parents again. I even had a girlfriend for a while, but she left me after a few months. I made a new best friend named Leon. I was having a blast here. This new start was good for me. That is why Reddit stay away from dangerous situations on the dark web. Maybe the dark web is not dangerous if you know how to stay safe, I don't know. But if you listen to my just don't order anything from there, don't even go on there. There is nothing for you there. Thanks for listening to my story. All I can say is that I learned my lesson. A few months ago, I was browsing some forums and dark websites out of sheer curiosity. You hear a lot about the dark web and its mysteries, and like any curious person, I wanted to see what it was all about. I knew the dangers and took precautions with a VPN and other security measures. I mostly stumbled upon typical black market stuff that was illegal. But then I found something that really stood out. It was a simple post on a relatively obscure forum. The title read, VR Experiment, $50,000 Compensation. I clicked on it, half expecting it to be a scam or some joke. But the more I read, the more genuine it seemed. The post detailed a virtual reality experiment that aimed to push the boundaries of human experience. Participants would be fully immersed in a custom-built VR world with the promise of groundbreaking technology that went beyond anything available to the public. They were offering $50,000 for just a few weeks of participation. The catch, participants had to sign an extensive non-disclosure agreement and go through a stringent selection process. The money was enticing, especially since I was dealing with mounting student loans in a dead-end job. But something about it felt off. The post emphasized the need for complete isolation during the experiment and hinted at potential psychological stress. I decided to ignore it. It sounded too good to be true and I wasn't about to risk my sanity or safety for a quick payday. But the thought lingered in my mind gnawing at me every time I checked my bank balance or received another collection call. 
I couldn't shake the feeling that I was letting a life-changing opportunity slip through my fingers. A few weeks passed and I tried to push the thought out of my head. Life went on as usual, mundane and predictable. But one night, while scrolling through news articles online, I stumbled upon a headline that made my blood run cold. Participants trapped in VR experiment, brain damage risk. The article was a detailed expose on the very experiment I had considered joining. According to the report, a rogue developer had taken control of the VR system, trapping the participants inside. The technology, which was supposed to be revolutionary, had a sinister flaw. If participants were forcibly removed from the VR world, it would cause irreversible brain damage. They were stuck in a digital nightmare with no clear way out. The article went on to describe the horror stories from the families of those trapped. One woman's husband, a software engineer, had been a participant. She described how he had become increasingly withdrawn before the experiment, following the strict isolation protocol. Now she was left with only cryptic messages from the developers, promising that they were working on a solution. What struck me the most were the descriptions of the participants' conditions. They were in a state of suspended animation, their bodies hooked up to life support systems, while their minds were lost in a virtual maze. Some families had tried to take legal action, but the NDAs were airtight. There was no way to hold the developers accountable. I couldn't believe what I was reading. If I had taken that offer, I could have been one of those poor souls trapped in a digital hell. The thought made me shudder. I felt a mix of relief and guilt, knowing that I had narrowly escaped such a fate while others were suffering. That night, I couldn't sleep. My mind kept replaying the details from the article, imagining what it must be like for those trapped in the VR world. I thought about the families desperate for answers and the participants caught in a nightmare with no escape. The dark web had always seemed like a place of curiosity and danger, but now it felt all too real and terrifying. After reading that article, I couldn't stop thinking about those people trapped in VR. Imagine being stuck in a video game with no way out, and your body is in a hospital bed. It was like something out of a horror movie, but it was real. I started searching online for more information. I found a few more articles and some discussions on tech forums. It was all very secretive because of the non-disclosure agreements but there were leaks and rumors from people who claimed to know someone involved. The story was always the same. The participants were stuck in the VR world and they couldn't be safely removed because the tech was messed up. The more I read, the more disturbing it got. The participants were in hospitals all over, lying in comas, hooked up to life support machines and still wearing their VR headsets. Doctors had tried to remove the headsets but quickly realized it caused severe problems. One guy started having a seizure when they tried to take it off. The doctors immediately put the headset back on, afraid they had already done damage. The families of the participants were devastated. They were always at the hospital, talking to their loved ones, holding their hands, hoping for a miracle. But the participants were unresponsive, their minds lost somewhere else. Some families tried to get help from the developers but they either didn't respond or gave vague reassurances that they were working on it. One of the saddest stories was about a young guy named Alex. He was a smart, tech-savvy college student, excited to be part of the experiment. His parents said he had become withdrawn in the weeks leading up to the experiment, following the isolation rules. Now, they were left with nothing but memories of his enthusiasm and the harsh reality of his lifeless body in a hospital bed. It was so frustrating. How could this happen? How could these developers let these people suffer like this? And where was the oversight? Who was holding these people accountable? The more I thought about it, the angrier I got. But there was nothing I could do. I was just someone who had luckily avoided this nightmare. Then I found a user on a tech forum who claimed to have insider information. This person, who went by the username Tech Savvy Insider, said they worked for a company involved in developing the VR tech used in the experiment. They said the problem was way bigger than anyone knew and that the company was trying to cover it up to avoid a massive scandal. 
According to Tech Savvy Insider, the VR system used a new kind of neural interface that directly interacted with the brain. It was supposed to create the most immersive experience ever, but it was still experimental and had many unknowns. The rogue developer who trapped the participants had exploited a flaw in the system, making it impossible to disconnect without causing brain damage. The company was scrambling to find a solution, but progress was slow and they were running out of time. I reached out to Tech Savvy Insider, hoping to get more information. To my surprise, they responded. We started chatting privately and they shared more details. They said the company was under immense pressure and there were rumors that some higher ups wanted to just cut their losses and shut everything down, leaving the participants trapped forever. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This was a nightmare, and it seemed like there was no way out. The families were being kept in the dark, the participants were stuck in a digital prison, and the company was more concerned about its reputation than saving lives. After talking with Tech Savvy Insider, I felt a mix of emotions. I felt really sad for the people trapped in VR, but I was also feeling incredibly lucky that I didn't sign up for it. It was a close call and knowing how badly things turned out for those who did sign up made me appreciate my normal, boring life a lot more. I couldn't stop thinking about those people. They couldn't eat, speak, or move. Their bodies were in hospitals, hooked up to all sorts of machines and IVs to keep them alive. The thought of them lying there helpless was heartbreaking. Their minds were somewhere else entirely, probably stuck in some nightmare VR scenario, while their families were left with empty shells of their loved ones. I read more about how they were being kept alive. They were on infusions, getting nutrients through tubes because they couldn't eat. The doctors had to turn them and clean them because they couldn't move. It was like they were in a coma, but worse because there was no telling if or when they would wake up. One story that really got to me was about a woman named Lisa. She had a young daughter and had signed up for the experiment, hoping to make some quick money for her family. Now her daughter was left without her mom and her husband was trying to hold things together while spending every free moment at the hospital. He described how Lisa looked so peaceful, like she was just sleeping, but he knew her mind was trapped in a digital prison. I felt so guilty for feeling relieved that it wasn't me, but at the same time, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had dodged a bullet. What if I had taken the offer? I would be in that hospital bed right now, my mind lost in some VR nightmare. I kept in touch with Tech Savvy Insider, hoping to learn more. They told me that the company was trying different ways to safely disconnect the participants, but nothing had worked so far. Every attempt seemed to cause more harm than good. The developers were under a lot of pressure, and there were even rumors of some of them quitting because they couldn't handle the guilt. It was a mess. The company was facing lawsuits from the families, but because of the NDAs, it was a legal nightmare. The families were desperate for answers and the participants were stuck in limbo, unable to wake up and unable to escape the VR world. I wanted to help, but I didn't know how. All I could do was keep digging for information and hope that somehow, some way, a solution would be found. I spent hours every day searching for updates, reading every article and following every lead. It was like an obsession, but I couldn't let it go. I felt like I owed it to those people to keep looking for answers, even if I couldn't do much to help. The more I learned, the more hopeless it seemed. The technology that was supposed to be so advanced had turned into a trap. The people who had signed up for the experiment were paying the price, and their families were suffering too. It was a nightmare, and there was no end in sight. I thought about visiting one of the hospitals to see it for myself but I was scared. I didn't know if I could handle seeing those people in person. I kept thinking about their families, how they must feel seeing their loved ones like that every day. Months went by and I kept up with the story. Every day I hoped to hear some good news. The pressure on the company was huge and they couldn't hide anymore. People were talking about it everywhere and it was all over the news. Then one day I saw an article that gave me a bit of hope. Some of the people trapped in the VR had actually managed to wake up and remove the headset without any problems. The doctors and developers were shocked. 
They didn't understand why some people could wake up safely while others couldn't. But for those who woke up, it was like a miracle. They were weak and confused, but alive and out of the VR. The article interviewed one of the survivors, a guy named Mark. He said the VR world was like a twisted, changing nightmare. He felt like he had been in there for years, even though it was only a few months. Mark was just so happy to be out and wanted to move on with his life and forget the whole thing. But not everyone had a happy ending. Some people never woke up. They died with the VR headset still on. Their bodies couldn't take it anymore. The families of those who died were devastated. They had hoped for so long, only to have it end in tragedy. One really sad story was about a man named Joe. His wife and kids had been by his side every day. When he died, they were heartbroken. His wife talked to the press, saying how unfair it was and how the experiment had ruined their lives. She was so angry at the company, and I totally understood why. For the families of those who woke up, it was a mix of happiness and anger. They were glad to have their loved ones back, but they were also really mad at the company for putting them through such a nightmare. Many of them talked about suing the company to get some justice. As for me, I felt a strange mix of relief and guilt. I was so glad I hadn't signed up for the experiment, but I couldn't stop thinking about those who had. I kept in touch with Tech Savvy Insider, who told me that the company was still trying to figure out why some people woke up and others didn't. They were looking at everything, health, age, even mental state, but they had no clear answers yet. I couldn't help but feel for those still trapped. There were still people out there, stuck in that VR world, and no one knew if they would ever wake up. The families of those still trapped were living in constant fear, waiting for news, hoping for a miracle. I joined an online support group for the families of the trapped participants. I thought maybe I could help in some way, even if it was just by listening. The stories I heard were so sad. Parents, spouses, siblings, all desperate for answers, all hoping for a miracle. As the months went by, a few more people woke up. Each time it was like a small victory, but it also made the losses even harder. For every person who woke up, there were many who didn't. Months turned into a year and the story kept developing. One day I got the chance to interview one of the survivors, a guy named David. He agreed to talk to me about his experience inside the VR world. I was nervous, but also really curious to hear his story firsthand. When I met David, he looked like he had been through a lot. He was still recovering, but he was eager to share his experience. He started by explaining what it was like inside the VR world. According to David, they were trapped in some kind of horror game. It was designed to be terrifying with creepy environments and dangerous challenges. The most disturbing part was that the game had a final boss they needed to defeat in order for everyone to wake up. David described the boss as incredibly overpowered. It was something out of a nightmare, huge, menacing, and seemingly invincible. No matter how hard they tried, they couldn't beat it. They kept respawning in the game after every defeat, but they also felt the pain of dying, stuck in an endless cycle of trying and failing. David said the situation was dire. People were losing hope, and the fear and stress were getting to everyone. But then, something unexpected happened. A young girl, about 16 or 17 years old, managed to do what no one else could. Her name was Emily. Emily was quiet and seemed unassuming, but she had a natural talent for the game. David said she was incredibly focused and determined. While everyone else was starting to give up, Emily kept pushing forward. She studied the boss's patterns, figured out its weaknesses, and came up with a strategy. One day, while everyone else was at their lowest point, Emily went into the final battle again. She fought the boss with a level of skill and precision that stunned everyone. After a long and intense fight, she managed to defeat the boss. It was a moment of disbelief and overwhelming joy. As soon as the boss was defeated, they all felt a strange sensation, like waking up from a deep sleep. David described the feeling of waking up in the hospital 
the VR headset finally being removed without any pain or damage. He and the others who had survived were incredibly grateful to Emily. She had saved them all from what seemed like an endless nightmare. I asked David how Emily was doing now. He said she was still recovering, like the rest of them, but she was hailed as a hero by everyone who had been trapped. She didn't talk much about what she did. She was just happy that they were all free. The interview with David left me with a mix of emotions. I was relieved that some of them had made it out, but I also felt the weight of those who didn't. The experience had changed them all forever. The company faced severe legal consequences, and the technology was banned until it could be made completely safe. Months turned into a year, and the story kept developing. One day, I got the chance to interview one of the survivors, a guy named David. He agreed to talk to me about his experience inside the VR world. I was nervous, but also really curious to hear his story firsthand. When I met David, he looked like he had been through a lot. He was still recovering, but he was eager to share his experience. He started by explaining what it was like inside the VR world. According to David, they were trapped in some kind of horror game. It was designed to be terrifying, with creepy environments and dangerous challenges. The most disturbing part was that the game had a final boss they needed to defeat in order for everyone to wake up. David described the boss as incredibly overpowered. It was something out of a nightmare, huge, menacing, and seemingly invincible. No matter how hard they tried, they couldn't beat it. They kept respawning in the game after every defeat, stuck in an endless cycle of trying and failing. David said the situation was dire, people were losing hope, and the fear and stress were getting to everyone. But then something unexpected happened. A young girl, about 16 or 17 years old, managed to do what no one else could. Her name was Emily. Emily was quiet and seemed unassuming but she had a natural talent for the game. David said she was incredibly focused and determined, while everyone else was starting to give up. Emily kept pushing forward. She studied the boss's patterns, figured out its weaknesses, and came up with a strategy. One day, while everyone else was at their lowest point, Emily went into the final battle again. She fought the boss with a level of skill and precision that stunned everyone. After a long and intense fight, she managed to defeat the boss. It was a moment of disbelief and overwhelming joy. As soon as the boss was defeated, they all felt a strange sensation, like waking up from a deep sleep. It all started a few months ago when I lost my job. I was desperate, broke, and on the brink of being evicted. I spent countless nights scrolling through job boards, but nothing seemed to fit. One night, while aimlessly browsing Reddit, I stumbled upon a thread about making quick money. Most of the suggestions were either ridiculous or borderline illegal, but one comment caught my eye. Make a quick buck on the dark web. Now, I'd always heard about the dark web in hushed whispers. A place where anything goes from drugs to hiring hitmen. It sounded like a terrible idea, but desperation can make you do crazy things. I figured, What's the harm in looking? So, I did a bit of research. It didn't take long to find guides on accessing the dark web. Armed with a VPN and Tor browser, I dove in. The interface was surprisingly simple, a stark contrast to the horrors it supposedly contained. I explored a bit, finding forums, marketplaces, and chat rooms. The sheer volume of illegal activities was overwhelming, but I was here for one reason money. I found a forum dedicated to scams. The users were boasting about their latest scores and offering tips on how to get started. I was hesitant at first, but then I saw a post about a phishing scheme. It seemed straightforward. Create a fake website that looks legitimate, trick people into entering their personal information, and sell that information to interested buyers. It sounded easy enough, and honestly, it seemed like a victimless crime. Just a bit of data theft, right? I spent the next week designing a fake banking website. It was alarmingly easy to make it look convincing. I bought a similar domain name, set up the site, and started sending out emails. At first, nothing happened. But then, a few days later, I got my first hit. 
Someone entered their login information, and I felt a rush of excitement and guilt. I repeated the process, tweaking the site and emails to make them more convincing. Soon, I had gathered a decent amount of data I was ready to sell. I returned to the forum and posted what I had. Within hours, I had multiple offers. The highest bidder was willing to pay $5,000 for the entire package. It was more money than I had seen in months, and I jumped at the offer. The transaction went smoothly, and I received the payment in Bitcoin. For a moment, I felt like a genius. I had found a way out of my financial woes. But that moment of euphoria didn't last long. The next morning, I woke up to a message on the forum from the buyer. He claimed that some of the information was fake and demanded a refund. I knew for a fact that everything I had provided was legitimate, and I told him so. The buyer didn't take it well. He threatened to expose me if I didn't return the money. I panicked. I didn't have the money to give back, and I couldn't risk being exposed. I blocked him and hoped that would be the end of it. But then, the real nightmare began. A few days later, I received an email from an anonymous sender. The subject line simply read, You're dead. My heart pounded as I opened it. The email contained my home address, my daily routine, and pictures of me taken without my knowledge. The message was clear. Refund the money, or else. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't go to the police. I was involved in illegal activities. I tried to ignore it, but the threats kept coming. They knew everything about me, every movement, every interaction. It was like they were inside my head. One night, as I was trying to fall asleep, I heard a noise outside my window. I froze, my heart beating out of my chest. I listened intently, straining to hear anything. Then I saw a shadow move across my window. I leaped out of bed and grabbed a baseball bat from my closet. With shaking hands, I approached the window and peered outside. Nothing. I was losing my mind. I started seeing shadows everywhere, hearing whispers in the dark. I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat. I was constantly on edge, expecting something terrible to happen at any moment. And then, one night, it did. I was sitting in my living room trying to distract myself with some TV when I heard the sound of glass breaking. I jumped up, my heart racing. The front door burst open and three masked men stormed in. Before I could react, they were on me, pinning me to the ground. One of them pressed a knife to my throat. We warned you, he hissed. You shouldn't have ignored us. I tried to explain, to beg for my life, but they weren't interested. They tied me up and ransacked my apartment, taking anything of value. As they left, one of them leaned down and whispered in my ear, You have one week to return the money. If you don't, we'll be back. And next time, we won't be so nice. I was left tied up on the floor, trembling with fear. It took hours for me to free myself, and by then, I knew what I had to do. I had to get the money back somehow, but I was running out of time, and I had no idea how far these people were willing to go. The first thing I did was look around my apartment. I sold everything I could, my TV, my laptop, my gaming console, anything that had some value. But that only got me so far. I still needed a lot more. I started looking for any job I could get. I picked up multiple part-time gigs, sometimes working 16-hour days. I delivered food, walked dogs, even did some cleaning jobs. Anything that paid, I did it. I was exhausted and barely sleeping, but I had to keep going. I felt like every minute counted down to something terrible. But even with all the work, I wasn't getting the money fast enough. I had to ask friends and family for loans, and that was hard. I've always been pretty independent, and admitting I was in deep trouble was embarrassing. I called my parents first. They knew I'd lost my job, but they had no idea how bad things were. I made up a story about needing money for an emergency, but I could tell they were disappointed. They helped me out, but it wasn't a lot. They're not wealthy themselves. Next, I called my closest friends. I told them I was in a tight spot and needed some help. Most of them didn't ask too many questions and lent me what they could. It wasn't much, but every bit helped. I even reached out to people I hadn't talked to in years. 
old college friends, distant relatives, anyone who might help. It was awkward and I hated it. Some people were kind and helped, others were skeptical or just said no. I couldn't blame them. It was a weird request out of the blue. As the days went by, I managed to scrape together a decent amount, but I was still short. I kept working, kept asking. The fear of those guys coming back kept me going. I couldn't afford to stop, not even for a moment. I was always looking over my shoulder, jumping at every noise. Every time I left my apartment, I was paranoid someone was following me. I couldn't shake the feeling they were watching, waiting for me to mess up. One night after another long day of working, I got a call from an old friend. He'd heard from a mutual friend that I was in trouble and offered to lend me some money. I couldn't believe my luck. We met up and he handed me a wad of cash. It wasn't enough to cover the whole debt, but it got me closer. As the week ended, I was still short of the full amount. I sent what I had managed to gather, hoping it would buy me more time. I sent the money through Bitcoin and waited. The next day I got another message. This is not enough. You have three more days. My heart sank. Three days to find the rest of the money or face whatever they had planned. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I had no choice. I started working even harder, picking up every shift I could, taking on more jobs. I barely slept, barely ate. I was running on pure adrenaline and fear. My friends noticed something was wrong, but I couldn't tell them the full story. I just said I was going through a rough patch. I knew I was running out of time and I didn't know if I could pull it off, but I had to keep going. I couldn't let those guys get to me again. I had to find a way to come up with the rest of the money. I was desperate, so I had to sell my watch. This wasn't just any watch. It was a birthday gift from my dad. He gave it to me on my 18th birthday, and it meant a lot to me. But I had no choice. I took it to a pawn shop, and they didn't give me nearly what it was worth, but it got me a bit closer to the amount I needed. Next. I took everything I had left in the bank. My savings were pretty much gone by this point, but I pulled out every last dollar. It wasn't much, but I was determined to get this done. Every bit helped and I was inching closer to the total. I worked every minute I could, taking on any job I could find. It was exhausting, but I couldn't stop. I needed to get the money together. The thought of those guys coming back kept me going, no matter how tired or hungry I was. Finally, after days of working non-stop, asking everyone I knew for help, and selling everything I could, I managed to scrape together the full amount. It was a huge relief, but I knew I wasn't safe yet. I had to get the money to them without putting myself in even more danger. I knew I couldn't meet them face to face. They could just take the money and kill me anyway. I had to be smart about this. I decided to leave the money in a location and send them the details. It felt like something out of a movie, but I didn't have any other choice. I found an old abandoned building on the outskirts of town. It was run down and creepy, but it seemed like the perfect place. I went there at night, carrying a bag with all the money I had gathered. My heart was pounding, and I was terrified someone was watching me. I found a spot inside the building and left the bag there. Then I quickly got out of there and headed home. As soon as I got back, I sent a message to the guys with the location of the money. I included a photo to show them it was all there. I waited, my heart racing, hoping they would be satisfied and this would all be over. Hours went by with no response. I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat. I just sat there staring at my phone, waiting for any sign that they had gotten the money. Finally, I got a message. We got the money. This better be the end of it. I let out a huge sigh of relief. It seemed like they were satisfied and I was safe, at least for now. But even with the money paid back, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread. They knew where I lived. They knew everything about me. I felt like I was always being watched, always on edge. I hoped this was the end of my ordeal, but a part of me knew it might not be over. I had gotten myself into this mess and I wasn't sure if I could ever really get out of it. But for now, I was just glad to be alive. 
After I got that message saying they got the money and it better be the end of it, I tried to go back to my normal life. But I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Every time I stepped outside, I felt paranoid. Every car that drove by, every person that looked my way, I felt like they were watching me. One night, I was lying in bed trying to sleep when I heard a noise outside my window. My heart started pounding. I got up slowly and peeked through the blinds. I saw a figure standing in the shadows just staring at my window. I froze. I quickly called the police, but when they arrived, the person was gone. They did a quick look around but didn't find anything. They told me it was probably nothing, maybe just a neighbor or someone passing by. But I knew better. I knew they were watching me. The next few days were a blur. I was constantly on edge, barely sleeping, barely eating. Then, one night, it happened. I was coming home from one of my jobs, and as I was unlocking my front door, I felt a sharp pain in my side. I looked down and saw blood. Someone had stabbed me. I turned around and saw one of the masked guys from before. He had a knife in his hand and a look of pure hatred in his eyes. I fought back, kicking and screaming, and somehow managed to break free. I ran as fast as I could, not looking back. I knew I couldn't go back to my apartment. It wasn't safe anymore. I ran to a friend's house and pounded on the door until they answered. I must have looked terrible, bleeding and panicked, but they let me in and called an ambulance. At the hospital, I told the doctors I was mugged. I couldn't tell them the truth. After I was patched up, I went to the police and reported the attack, but again, I couldn't tell them the whole story. I just said it was a random mugging. They took my statement and said they'd investigate, but I knew there wasn't much they could do. I couldn't stay at my friend's place. I didn't want to put them in danger, so I grabbed some essentials and left. I've been on the run ever since, moving from place to place, trying to stay off the radar. I stay in cheap motels, sometimes sleeping in my car. I'm always looking over my shoulder, always paranoid. I've cut off contact with most people I know. It's too risky. I've only told a few close friends what's really going on, and they've been helping me as much as they can. But it's tough. I'm constantly scared, constantly tired. I don't know how much longer I can keep this up. I'm writing this from yet another motel room. I don't know what my next move is. I just know I need to keep moving, keep hiding. I don't know if these guys will ever stop looking for me. I don't know if I'll ever be safe again. So after running and hiding for what felt like forever, I was exhausted and desperate. I was running out of places to go and options to try. I was scared all the time and didn't know who to trust. One night, I was at a bar in a town I'd never been to before, just trying to keep a low profile. I struck up a conversation with a guy sitting next to me. He seemed friendly enough, and I needed someone to talk to. Turns out, this guy was more than just a regular dude at the bar. He had connections, money, and power. His name was Mike. As we talked, I ended up spilling a bit of my story, not everything, but enough for him to get the idea that I was in deep trouble. To my surprise, he offered to help. Mike told me he had dealt with people like the ones after me before and that he had the resources to make them back off for good. I was skeptical at first, but what choice did I have? I was at the end of my rope. I told him everything and he listened without judging. The next day, Mike made some calls. I don't know exactly what he did or who he talked to, but within a few days, the threat stopped. No more shadowy figures, no more threatening messages. It was like a huge weight lifted off my shoulders. I could finally breathe again, but Mike's help didn't come for free. He told me I'd have to work for him to pay off the favor. I didn't mind. After everything I'd been through, I was just grateful to be alive, so I started working for him, doing whatever he needed. Sometimes it was legit work, sometimes it was a bit shady, but nothing illegal. I wasn't about to go down that road again. I've been working my ass off for Mike ever since. It's tough, but it's a lot better than running for my life. I've managed to save up a bit of money, and I'm slowly getting my life back on track. It's not the life I imagined for myself, but it's a life and I'm alive. 
I don't know if I'll ever be able to fully relax or trust people the same way again. The experience has left me scarred and always looking over my shoulder. But I'm trying to move forward, one day at a time. So, that's my story. It's been a wild ride, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. If there's one thing I've learned, it's to be careful what you get yourself into. Desperation can make you do crazy things, but sometimes the price you pay is far greater than you ever imagined. Thanks for listening, everyone. Stay safe out there and stay away from the dark web.